Hello, I'm Eric Greenberg, Director of Museums for the Newport Restoration Foundation. Thank you for your interest in Collective Perspectives, a series of presentations and discussions about the past and present significance of 18th century Newport furniture. We had originally planned to host these sessions on site here at the Whitehorn House Museum and at other locations in Newport, Rhode Island. But with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to rethink our plans and these sessions were hosted online over a four-day period in July of 2020. The conversations and presentations that emerged from these sessions were really wonderful. They were educational and they were entertaining, and it's a great pleasure for us to show you these presentations on our NRF YouTube channel. Before we begin, let me just make a few observations. First, because these sessions were handled remotely, sometimes the audio of our panelists can dip in and out a little bit, but I believe that on the whole, our panelists' audio feeds should be pretty clear and pretty audible. Another point is that at different times in our Q&A uh, and group panel discussions, you will see the image of a young woman on screen who rarely talks during the discussions. That's our manager of education and public programs, uh, Caitlin Seller, who fields the online questions during the discussion uh, session. Also, Caitlin's work in moving our public programming online has been invaluable this season. In fact, she's filming me as I speak. And finally, let me just observe that at the beginning of each of these videos, you'll see two short films. Uh, the first will be a funds appeal from our executive director, Mark Thompson. Uh, and the second will be a short movie about the Whitehorn House Museum. I hope you'll seriously consider Mark's appeal and possibly donate to the Newport Restoration Foundation. And I hope you find the information that we share really interesting. And that if you can, you'll come to Newport this summer and visit us at the White House Museum. Enjoy the show. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark Thompson and I'm Executive Director of the Newport Restoration Foundation. Thank you for joining us for this program today. Our founder, Doris Duke, was enamored with the 18th century. Evidence of her passion for restoring 18th century houses is all around us here in Newport. But she also had an avid interest in objects related to domestic life. And ultimately, she assembled a wonderful collection of furniture created here in Rhode Island and in Newport in particular. As you may know, Newport furniture represents some of the finest work of 18th century American decorative arts. And we are thrilled to be able to share our collection with you at the Whitehorn House Museum. This program is part of our ongoing effort to tell the story of that furniture and to the people who made it and to the people who acquired it. This program has been generously supported by a grant from the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities. As you might imagine, the work of the Whitehorn House Museum relies upon the generosity of many individuals and corporations who share our passion for 18th century history and 18th century material culture. If this description fits you, we hope you'll consider donating to the Newport Restoration Foundation. It's easy to do. Just visit our website at newportrestoration.org and click on the word support. Any amount that you can afford to give will be genuinely appreciated. I hope you enjoyed today's program and thank you. The Whitehorn House Museum first opened its doors to the public in 1974 and today celebrates the craftsmen and womanship, artistry and industry of colonial Newport furniture. At the museum, you will explore the origins of Newport furniture making and meet the people involved in the complex interconnected furniture industry, including the enslaved persons who harvested mahogany wood, the cabinet makers, joiners, and turners who created the expertly crafted pieces, the successful merchants who sold and traded furniture in Newport and throughout the Atlantic world, and the consumers, men and women who admired, purchased, displayed, and used the furniture every day. You will see the range of ingenuity in cabinet making from the unique commissioned high-end products to the everyday but still expertly crafted Windsor chair. 
and you will discover how ongoing research into Newport furniture leads to a more complex and complete understanding of culture, industry, and society in the colonial period, and how that impacts our own lives today. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, Whitehorn really is a beautiful place, and I hope you will come visit us um, when you can. Um, so let's get down to this in earnest. Our first session of this multi-session series is a keynote address from Dr. Patricia Kane, the Friends of American Arts Curator of American Art, uh, I'm sorry, the Friends of American Arts Curator of American Decorative Arts at Yale University Art Gallery. Pat holds an MA from the Winterthur Program in Early American Culture and a PhD from Yale University in the History of Art. To those of us who work in the field of 18th century Rhode Island furniture, Pat is an invaluable resource and a tireless scholar con whose continuing work quite literally forms and reforms our understanding of our collections as her scholarship advances and grows. Many of us are particularly indebted to Dr. Kane for the creation of and her continuing contributions to Yale's Rhode Island Furniture Archive, a vast database consisting of over 5,000 pieces of furniture attributed to Rhode Island makers from the 1630s until the early 19th century, including many of the pieces in NRF's furniture collection. Dr. Kane has curated numerous exhibitions and written many published works, far, far too many to mention in this introduction. But perhaps the most notable of these for tonight's purposes is the 2016 exhibition and its accompanying catalog, Art and Industry in Early America, Rhode Island Furniture 1650 to 1830, a groundbreaking exhibition and scholarly catalog that has helped shape our understanding of Rhode Island furniture, its makers, and its role in trade and commerce in New England and the Atlantic world. It is also the title of this evening's address. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome Pat Kane and to hear what she has to tell us. Welcome, Pat. Thank you, Eric. And I guess now um, you'll let me share my screen. I, sure, <laughs> let's do that. Uh, you should be able to share your screen. So tonight I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, dual aspects of the uh, cabinet making trade in Rhode Island in the uh, 18th century, both its art and its industry. And as Mark said a few moments ago, uh, Rhode Island produced some of the most aesthetically uh, successful furniture of the 18th century that has been prized by uh, collectors and institutions for more than uh, a century. And that furniture really came out of an economic uh, system that simultaneously was both local and international. And seafaring commerce is what drove the 18th century economy of Rhode Island. And as you'll see, the furniture makers um, participated in this vigorously. I think today for many of us, the word industry um, really conjures up an image of a large factory, perhaps belching smoke. But in the 18th century, uh, it had a very different meaning. Um, it really was uh, a revered uh, personal value. And um, for instance, why did the successful provenance merchant, John Brown, uh, have a squirrel as the finial? in the paneling of his parlor. You see the little guy um, right up here. And the same parlor, when it uh, originally, and now in its restoration, has squirrels all throughout the wallpaper. So why is this? Well, in the 18th century, the squirrel was the symbol of industriousness. And um, as uh, we've seen already this evening, and you'll see further, uh, numerous Rhode Island ships with the name industry attest to this as well. So before we um, dive further into the furniture, I'd just like to uh, set the geography for you all uh, towards the bottom of this map, which was created in 1777 uh, to help the British with their invasion of, New of Rhode Island. Um, we see the island of Rhode Island, with at the very 
Tippy End, the town of Newport, which has a very deep harbor and is quite a, immediately adjacent to the Atlantic. What a location for trade. Uh, just some of the other towns I'll mention tonight, I'd like to point them out. Uh, over here on the left border is Kingston. Further north is East Greenwich. Uh, the town of Bristol uh, is on this peninsula and just north of that, the town of Warren. And then at the end of Narragansett Bay, we have the town of Providence. And so uh, this is uh, what made up the central part of, the, um, of Narragansett Bay. I would like to make the point that uh, in the first uh, quarter of the 18th century, there were already um, well-established schools of cabinet making uh, throughout uh, Rhode Island. From the town of Warren, we have this exceptional uh, fall front desk, a very unusual form that was owned there by a member of the child's family who were shipbuilders. Uh, from Providence, uh, the high chest in the center, uh, may have come into the Bacchus family through Susanna Mason, whose family hailed from Rehoboth, which is, um, uh, falls within the orbit of Providence. And uh, on the right then, a high chest uh, that I believe was made in Newport that was owned by Gordon Smith, who lived in Groton, Connecticut. And all of these pieces have the dis these distinguishing features of early 18th century Rhode Island furniture, and that is that the, um, the veneer creates a band, is used to create a band uh, down the facade of these case pieces. And the legs are very, very attenuated and come to very thin points. And in this way, um, the Rhode Island, the early Rhode Island furniture uh, is quite different from the more commonplace uh, furniture of this type that was being made in um, Massachusetts. So here is Newport in 1740. This is an overmantel uh, painting. And you see this bustling um, harbor uh, filled with sloops and brigantines. These were the ships that were taking the furniture uh, either north or south. And I'd also like to point out that um, in this view, this little cluster over to the left is what is known as the point. And that is where most of the, not all, but many of the cabinet makers in Newport lived and worked uh, very much in close proximity uh, to one another. And so, uh, as we know, the export trade was really, really uh, Im important as part of this economy coming out of, um, of Newport. And here we have a simple slant front desk, um, which was made by John Goddard in 1745. He uh, really was at the very outset of his career at that point in time. He becomes a very important Newport cabinet maker. And the desk bears this label uh, that says made by John Goddard of Newport on Rhode Island. Remember, Rhode Island is the island that Newport is on uh, in the year of our Lord, 1745. And indeed, in the 19th century, this desk was recovered in Milton, Nova Scotia. And uh, I believe it was probably sent there um, in the 18th century and uh, owned in that area. Um, and um, so this is the type of furniture that um, many cabinet makers in Newport were making to uh, send on ships. And we know, for instance, from the uh, research that um, Jean Sloan has done, um, her analysis of John Cahoon's account book, uh, that between which ranges in date from 1749 to 1760, that 34% of uh, the furniture he was making was made for export and only 20% was being made for uh, local use. And in that time, at least from 1750 to 1759, he employed as many as seven different, uh, what she identifies as journeymen, to make furniture for him, including Jonathan Byer, 
Joe Clark, Gideon Lawton, Moses Norton, uh, James Serrell, Jonathan Sweat, and Benjamin Tare. And many of these makers go on uh, to establish shops of their own, uh, not all, but um, many. And tonight I'm really only going to focus on Gideon Lawton because we have some wonderful documentation from the 1760s of uh, Gideon Lawton and his output. I'm, um, I'm showing you this, not really expecting you to be able to read this document. It's uh, evidence of an account presented in a court case. Lawton is being sued by a merchant, Samuel Fowler. But um, down the uh, left margin of these pages are the year and the month. Uh, and within the month, let's say of May, he, these little in increments are what he's actually purchasing. And from tallying that up, we know that he was churning out a desk about every two weeks. And so this was a typical order. This is what Gideon Lawton had to buy to outfit his desk. Um, and it accounts for every bit of hardware on a four-door uh, desk. This happens to be Goddard's three-door desk. But we know that it, he was making these simple forms because he only buys five small nubs. And those are the nubs that are used on the interior, probably one for the drawer behind the prospect. And unlike the um, 11 drawer, typical tripartite Newport desk um, that was made probably more likely for local consumption. So um, this is, you know, tells us exactly what Gideon Lawton was uh, producing at that time. Another very important example of the export trade from Newport um, is the Charter Party Agreement that was signed by um, John Cajon, uh, that we've talked about, uh, Constant Bailey, who was another Newport uh, joiner, and Benjamin Peabody. And they uh, came together as uh, in a collaboration uh, to uh, send furniture from Newport to North Carolina and then come back again. And this is uh, what remains of a Newport flat top high chest. Uh, it may have had pad feet or slipper feet, but it is actually signed by um, Constant Bailey. And once again, he's giving you uh, or giving the, uh, his audience at that time an indication of where he is. He's in Newport on Rhode Island, should you want any additional furniture from him. And in fact, this uh, piece of furniture was recovered in uh, Perkins County, North Carolina. So it may well have been part of the Chartered Party Agreement of 1749 or some of Constant Bailey's later um, uh, exports. And the other party in uh, that consortium was Benjamin Peabody. And uh, it's only recently that I've been able to identify what kinds of furniture Benjamin Peabody was making. And there are about a half a dozen uh, objects that relate to this this high chest. And in fact, one of them is on loan uh, to the um, Whitehorn House. They all share uh, similar characteristics. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Peabody's high chest has a very low uh, pediment, has a very distinctive finial, uh, this urn shape with this little arcaded collar at the top, and a tip that isn't the form of an acorn. And then the shell, very fluid, but with a very flat uh, center. And so these aspects of, um, of uh, this high chest has enabled me to identify other pieces that uh, probably were made in, in Peabody's uh, shop. So not only did uh, people like Cajon and um, Bailey and Peabody come together to rent a vessel to, to send furniture um, uh, to faraway ports. But many uh, joiners aspired to being merchants and Eliezer Trevitt is one of them. Uh, Trevitt we know was making furniture in the 1730s and here by 1768, he has entered into an agreement with Robert Stevens 
uh, and Stephen Sun uh, for a venture to uh, Cape Verde Island. Uh, he promises to pay them 700 and some odd pounds from this venture. And uh, we don't know what was on this particular venture, but at about the same, a few months later, we find Eliezer Trevitt uh, as debtor to James Pittman, another Newport joiner. And so what is Pittman making for him? He's making a mahogany desk, a mahogany case of drawers, two maple desks. But the important thing about this document is that uh, all those pieces are cased. And by that, we mean crated. So we know that this furniture was really made to be uh, sent uh, far away, perhaps even to the Cape Verde Islands. So now I'd like to shift away from this export furniture to um, the furniture that um, the merchants who made fortunes from this trade um, were buying for themselves. Uh, and I'd like to start here with John Bannister because he played such an important role in uh, the development of maritime trade in Newport. He is from a Boston merchant family. He arrives in Newport in the 1730s. And in the late 1730s, he begins uh, trading directly from Newport to uh, England. And so he opens up transatlantic trade, um, uh, which is uh, many times more lucrative. And uh, here we see his portrait by uh, Robert Feek, uh, alongside uh, one piece of uh, the architecture from a grand house he was able to build for himself in Middletown, Rhode Island. Uh, comes from a, the stair hall that uh, is installed at the Winter Tour um, Museum. But Newport also then developed a triangle trade um, by uh, distilling rum in Newport, which they shipped then to Africa, where it was traded for slaves who were then transported to the Caribbean uh, for that plantation economy there. And uh, in the Caribbean, they would purchase molasses and other commodities, including mahogany, uh, and bring that back uh, to Newport. So this trade generated um, very great fortunes. Now, Job Townsend Sr. and his younger brother, Christopher, sort of stand at the beginning of uh, a tremendous dynasty of Newport uh, cabinet makers. Um, the desk on the left by Job um, uh, has lost its pediment. It's also lost part of its feet, uh, but nonetheless, it's still regarded as an icon of um, Rhode Island furniture uh, because it bears his label and it's the only labeled object or documented object we know by Job Townsend. Uh, on the other screen on the right is this magnificent desk and bookcase uh, signed by Christopher. It has an extraordinarily unusual and early um, pediment, this rounded Baroque pediment form, very large urn-shaped finials with flames, uh, concave blocking and carved shells on the door. But one of, and it was made for um, Mary and Nathan Carpenter, and we know that Nathan was involved in the West Indian trade. And um, the extraordinary thing about Christopher's desk and bookcase is that all the hardware is made of silver. And it was made for this commission by Samuel Casey, who was a Kingston uh, silversmith. Um, I mean, it's truly extraordinary. Not only the handles, but the hinges on uh, nonetheless were silver. So this is luxury par excellence. Uh, this is really, um, um, you know, a luxurious living to have silver hardware. And opposite it, we have the label that is on Job Townsend's desk. Now, both, um, both men had sons who followed them in the cabinet making trade. Uh, Christopher had two. Uh, his son John is perhaps the best known. Uh, and here is a high chest signed by John. Again, it's indicating it's made in Newport. 
Uh, and it's actually dated uh, 1756. Um, and it really shows us John at the very beginning of his career. Uh, his, his high chests that he made later are quite different. I mean, this one has a very, very tall uh, pediment. Uh, the bonnet is open, not closed, the way um, so many um, um, Newport later high chests and other case pieces tend to have closed bonnets. The finial is quite similar to the finial that his um, father was using on the desk and bookcase we've just seen. And the shell in this case is a pendant shell, which he does on about one other piece of furniture uh, and then moves to the more traditional upright um, shell. Uh, his uh, younger brother, Jonathan, also uh, is known by at least one piece, um, but Jonathan's career was really cut short by um, smallpox. And um, Jobs had a number of sons who followed him in the furniture making trade. Um, uh, I'm showing you here uh, a bureau table made by Edmund. Uh, and this bureau table has an inscription on its underside uh, made by Edmund Townsend in Newport, Rhode Island, 1764. And again, I think it's because this was being shipped. This was actually made for John Deschon, who lived in New London, Connecticut. And uh, I think many of these signatures that involved where the thing was made, um, I suspect, were made to inform a more remote and not local audience. Uh, it's a classic example of the type of case piece, lock front case piece with the blocking carved by these really look um, very voluptuous uh, Newport shells. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about it is it's actually made of manchineal, not mahogany. Um, and we've there are a few pieces of furniture made of manchineal have been identified uh, from Newport. Uh, one of Job's other sons, Thomas, um, was responsible for this magnificent uh, chest on chest. Uh, again, it was made for a client who was not local. It was made for Robert Gardner, who lived on Gardner's Island uh, in New York, at least in Long Island Sound, associated with Long Island. And uh, it's also signed by Nicholas Easton and dated by Easton, um, 1772. I assume that Easton was probably a, an apprentice or journeyman um, in Townsend's shop. But here is a classic Newport case piece. You have uh, the facade flanked by these uh, quarter columns, both at the top and the bottom. The typical Newport foot with the very small little peak down here, uh, very high OG. A closed um, bonnet, which is what becomes uh, fairly typical in Newport. And the uh, tympanum area filled in with these applied plaques. Um, the uh, uh, cornice moldings return upon themselves right at the top here. And then the hole is capped by these um, somewhat squashed uh, urns that are fluted and have flame uh, finials at the top. Uh, John Goddard also was associated with um, the Job Townsend shop. Uh, he married um, uh, Job Townsend's daughter, Hannah. And uh, it's been assumed in the uh, scholarship that, uh, that that was evidence that he probably uh, was uh, trained and living in Job Townsend's uh, household. And these are three um, magnificent pieces um, by Goddard. Um, the desk and bookcase and the uh, uh, table were uh, both made in the early 1760s. Um, the high chest um, was probably made um, anywhere from 1760 up to the time of the revolution. Um, but what we have here is uh, you know, a prime example of the um, a venerated um, Newport six shell desk and bookcase. And what is the brilliance of this design? Uh, 
Well, we have the blocking. Um, oops, sorry, folks. On the uh, lower section that carries up into the fall board where it's capped by these um, magnificent shelves. But the real genius of um, the design is that the uh, bookcase part is not just two doors, but it is a tripartite uh, division. One door folds back upon itself. And so uh, Goddard is able to continue the blocking from the bottom right up through, uh, through his bookcase. And um, again, we have the closed bonnet, the tympanum boards, and urn-shaped finials. The same treatment as you see on the pediment of his high chest. And the tea table in the middle, uh, again, this elegant, voluptuous form with these serpentine curves uh, outlining the skirt. Uh, it's, it's really a masterpiece of, um, of Newport uh, cabinet making. Um, there are a few of these tables that we can associate uh, with John Goddard. So um, I'd like to uh, tell you now about um, uh, a woman who uh, bought uh, three pieces exactly like this. Um, um, these pieces, uh, the desk and bookcase, we don't know where that was owned in the 18th century, uh, nor the high chest, but the, um, the tea table was made for Jabez Bowen of Providence, and I think that's important, and I'd like you to uh, remember that. But um, in 1761, a 20-year-old Eunice Rhodes uh, comes from Providence with her Providence friend, Mary Brown, to go shopping for furniture. She uh, is about to marry uh, Thomas Hazard, who's a Newport merchant. And uh, we know about this shopping expedition because uh, it all re it, uh, resulted in a lawsuit. And um, so uh, I'd like to uh, give you Mary's words where she testified at the trial about that. And she says, sometime in the year 1761, being in Rhode Island, I went to Mr. Goddard's with Eunice Rhodes, where Eunice asked the price of a desk and bookcase that he made, so they know what he is making. He replied, it was 700 pounds was the price. And for a China table, it was 120 pounds. Uh, and she, Mary reports, she thought it to be very dear. So she said to him that she would inquire of others to see if um, the others asked the same price. And if they did, she would give it to him. So she said, I'll probably wait on you again. And so indeed they did. Sometime later, they came back to uh, Mr. Goddard's shop and Eunice told him that she would have them and he promised to deliver them, that is the bookcase and the uh, tea table in about six weeks time. Uh, we know that she um, went later with her sister-in-law after she was married, with her sister-in-law a few months later, and actually purchased a high chest of, of drawers like this one. And there, the price that was quoted for it was 250 pounds, so it was testified at the trial. Well, uh, the bill that got rendered to the husband uh, had the mahogany swell front desk and bookcase uh, priced at $750, not 700. It had a mahogany compassed case priced at 300 pounds, not 250, as she was quoted, and the scallop tea table uh, priced at 150 pounds, not 120 pounds, as she was quoted. I would have loved to have been in the household when this bill arrived, and um, um, uh, you know, that is 1,200 pounds worth of furniture we're talking about here. Uh, it's a wonderful document of what uh, the craftsmen called these forms. It is also a wonderful document uh, because of this little notation that's over here on the right side of the um, bill. 
uh, which shows how um, Hazard paid for this furniture. Uh, there was an order on Benjamin Tucker for a thousand feet of mahogany, and Hazard himself was supplying 90 feet of mahogany. So um, about you know 1,100 feet of mahogany is what Goddard's getting in exchange for making this furniture. And my cabinet making friends tell me it would have taken about 180 board feet to make this order. Um, and so Goddard has got himself about, you know, 900 additional board feet of mahogany to use in his shop. And so now I'd like to turn to the export trade in Providence. Um, uh, it was really with our exhibition that Eric mentioned that um, this information about the export trade in Providence really came to light. Uh, and that was largely through, uh, in different ways. Uh, one was through uh, documentation. I'm showing you here, I do not expect you to read it. Um, this bill from Thomas Garrett to uh, the mariner uh, Simeon Potter, who lived in Bristol. And uh, it runs from about 1748 to 1753. And the length of it shows you all the uh, lists all these different tasks that Garrett, uh, who was a Newport trained cabinet maker who had moved to Providence, undertook for Potter to get this uh, vessel ready to sail. And at the very end of the account, we see that he is also not only supplying lumber and labor for building the vessel, but he's supplying uh, desks, six desks a six foot table, uh, two tables of four and a half feet, um, and uh, cases for all of that furniture. So again, he's making this uh, to be cased and sent on this voyage uh, uh, to North Carolina once more. And so the table that he may have been making, um, we don't know who made this example, but this is a maple and birch table with straight turned legs. I'm sure this is a four and a half foot table. This is the kind of table that would have been, you know, in that order roughly. Uh, the desks may have been like this example, which is from Providence, it's made of cherry. It has this, um, this two tier uh, interior, which uh, is what the, uh, quite different from the Newport configuration. Um, but uh, as I was um, thinking about this desk today, I realized since uh, Thomas Garrett was a, a cabinet maker from Newport, he may not have been making things in this um, uh, uh, Providence vein. He may have uh, been following his uh, training in Newport. Um, another really key document in demonstrating uh, the export trade in Providence is this extraordinary agreement that six um, Providence cabinet makers uh, um, uh, uh, came to in 1756 and then it was amended in 1757. And what it is, again, you cannot read this, I'm sure, but it is a list of a form, like a high case of drawers. You could have it, what they're listing is the price that they would sell it to a customer for. And a price in mahogany is more expensive than a price in black walnut. And that black walnut example is more expensive than uh, the same form in maple. So that is what they're recording here. The um, amended document in 57, I think is important because it includes this phrase to, uh, to casing of a desk, five pounds. So that's what they would charge to, um, make cases for furniture that was being shipped out. So who were these six cabinet makers? Here are their names on the document. They were Gresham Carpenter, Grindle Rawson, Benjamin Hunt, John Power, Philip Potter, and Joseph Sweeting. And unfortunately, we do not know of any documented furniture by any of these Providence um, cabinet makers. Uh, they had to be 
you know, to come to this agreement, they were no doubt very well established, but there is really no firm documentation for any of them. And there's also very little, if any, documentation for them being involved in the export trade other than their signing this document, with the exception of Philip Potter. So Potter, this is Potter's, a, a page from Potter's account in the account book of um, William Barker, who was a Providence chair maker. And um, what Barker is providing for Potter is lots of turned parts, both for chairs, uh, table legs, like the table we saw with straight turned legs, uh, also uh, a whipple tree uh, for um, a riding chair. Um, and so on the first line in 1766, he's turning 86 chair sticks. And what I think the chair sticks are, are the stretchers that you see uh, on a, a typical um, Rhode Island uh, chair. Uh, there are four stretchers per chair. So if he's purchasing at that point in time, 86 of them. Uh, he's, he's making at least 20 chairs. Um, unfortunately, uh, for Potter, uh, his risk taking, all of these voyages, of course, uh, that um, these cabinet makers undertook, involved enormous risk. And for Potter, uh, it turned out badly. He had sent a ship out, it foundered, was a total loss, and he essentially was bankrupt. And so this is the account of uh, the auction in 1770 to sell all his belongings. It includes um, half a hull for a vessel that weighed about uh, 70 tons. Uh, it's launched but unfinished. Uh, he has maple, oak, uh, pine, mahogany, and black walnut boards. He's got various pieces of joiner's work unfinished and five riding chairs partly finished. So not only is this uh, cabinet maker uh, building vessels, making furniture, but he's also making riding chairs, which were a hot commodity in the export trade. And so this is one very industrious joiner. Unfortunately, it all ended badly. As his grandson said, he uh, was what little he had left after this auction, he uh, took with him to Vermont, Putney, Vermont, where he spent the rest of his days and, and died there, sort of a, a broken man. So we don't know who was making uh, this Providence furniture, but it certainly has a very, this is the indigenous kind of Providence look, if you will. Um, these three pieces um, obviously are looking to Newport for their cues of having the blocking, uh, capped by shells. Um, they use an OG bracket foot that uh, is somewhat different in that it has this little nubbin down here. It's not quite the Newport foot. What's different about them in terms of uh, adapting the Newport style as they do, is that these shells are carved out of the solid. They are not carved on the bench and applied as later Newport shells tend to be. And as Jeffrey Green has um, observed, um, I think very interestingly, that um, by uh, the Newport uh, cabinet makers first made shells carved from the solid, but then they moved to making them uh, be carved on the bench and applied to the blocking, the blocking like on the full boards applied was that it really uh, allowed them to be much more productive. And uh, it was a great observation that uh, Jeffrey made at the time of our exhibition. So here we see, for instance, um, the pitch pediment. This turns up in a number of late 18th century uh, provenance pieces. Uh, it becomes um, a, a favored form of pediment treatment in provenance. Um, I know of uh, no examples, there may be some, but they're unknown to me of that happening in um, 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 Newport. Uh, with the desk and bookcase on the uh, right, 
Um, we have a pediment uh, that owes its design. It's looking very much at Massachusetts. Uh, it's uh, got large oculi. Um, finials that are little urns with flames. Um, and so we find uh, Providence falling within the orbit of Massachusetts in certain ways. And then at the very center, um, we have um, a, a Providence piece with a scroll pediment that ends in carved rosettes up here. And this is really a favored form of Providence treatments of pediments, unlike the closed bonnets and the uh, cornice moldings that return on themselves that we associate with Newport. So in 1772, something really dramatic happened to uh, furniture making in Providence. And that was the arrival of uh, Daniel Spencer. He uh, had been working in Newport for about 10 years. Uh, he's the nephew, a nephew of uh, John Goddard. He may well have trained in, in Goddard's shop. And um, uh, certainly uh, he would have been aware of um, people like Jabez Bowen, uh, Eunice Rhodes, who were from Providence, uh, who were um, shopping for furniture in Newport. And I think he saw an opportunity there. And so he uh, picked up his household, his tools, and establishes himself in Providence. And so what he does there is really quite remarkable. What we see in this desk and bookcase, which is at Yale and was made for John Brown, the Providence merchant, is the classic Newport six shell uh, desk and bookcase with the blocking, sorry about that, with the blocking on the um, base continuing up through this uh, tripartite um, division of the bookcase doors. But what happens up above? There are uh, panels in the tympanum, but he has totally moved away from uh, the closed bonnet of Newport, and he has adopted the uh, scroll bonnet ending in rosettes that was favored in, um, in the Providence case furniture. And in so doing, He's really made a hybrid form, which uh, I think many people would say is, is quite um, aesthetically successful. Um, the, there are a number of pieces attributed or that I've attributed to him. Uh, most, not all, but most have this curious little mark in the uh, interior front corners of his drawers. Um, I've called it a, a cursive one. It's a little like a one with a little loopy tail. And um, it's really uh, his working method. He, he marks his drawers with letters on the interior as well. And those are, uh, the, in that way, that follows his uncle's practice. So in Providence, he finds other important clients beyond John Brown. Uh, this chest on chest, for instance, was um, owned by Jabez Bowen, who you will recall purchased uh, the tea table from John Gardard in 1763. And so here again, we have the um, blocking and shell carving in the bottom section of this object. And up above, however, look at this low, what is happening here? Uh, this pediment drawer uh, with a carved shell. In Newport furniture, one just does not find those pediment drawers intruding into the tympanum. And this again is something that um, is uh, probably coming from uh, Massachusetts furniture making. And uh, it's another step in this kind of hybridization that uh, Spencer engages in once he is in Providence. 
The desk and bookcase on the right was uh, made for the brother of um, John Brown, Nicholas Brown, another prominent uh, Providence merchant. And uh, indeed, it's like um, the taller cousin of the Yale example. It's enormously tall and essentially has all the elements that the uh, Yale desk and bookcase has. But now to bring this uh, closer to home, um, when Eric was introducing tonight's program, you were seeing in the background this chest on chest which uh, is in the parlor, the front parlor at the Whitehorn House. And um, I had the opportunity to examine it in the last year. And indeed, it, it too is by Daniel Spencer. We don't know for whom this was made, um, but uh, once again, here he's taken the hybridization, if you will, even one step further. He's adapted the uh, Providence pediment He's inserting the uh, Massachusetts um, pediment drawer, but also look at how instead of quarter columns framing the case, as we've seen on the other pieces, what he's got here are flat pilasters. And uh, again, this is something that's coming right out of um, a Massachusetts uh, tradition. Um, and so Massachusetts uh, inserts itself in uh, numerous ways um, in uh, Providence uh, furniture making, and uh, Daniel uh, melds these, uh, these making traditions. And while this um, infrared shot of the drawer, one of the drawers in the um, Whitehorn House chest is not as clear as the professional shot that was in my book, I think perhaps you can see here this little graphite, um, sort of a one with a little loopy tail right there. And so that really um, nails it for Daniel Spencer. Um, what's ultimately interesting about Spencer, which we learned from um, uh, after um, the um, Rhode Island Furniture Exhibition was up, was that he migrates once more. He leaves Providence uh, probably about 1790 and goes to Lexington, Kentucky, where he is, is known to have made tall case, uh, cases for tall case clocks that have all the hallmarks of um, uh, Providence uh, clock cases. Um, and so he uh, works there for a few years uh, and unfortunately dies. Um, uh, and whether he made furniture in Lexington that again melds Kentucky um, aesthetic with uh, these um, Rhode Island aesthetic uh, remains to be seen. Um, and so I'd just like to remind you all that uh, the work we're doing on um, Rhode Island furniture, as Eric says, continues. Uh, we're constantly adding data to the Rhode Island Furniture Archive. And um, uh, I'm constantly making new discoveries. Um, the discovery of the last year or so is the being able to put together the group of pieces by Benjamin Peabody. And it's um, um, my hope before I uh, kick the bucket and no longer can do this is that one of those six names on the Providence Cabinet Makers Agreement comes into focus with uh, some object emerging that allows us to um, uh, give uh, some uh, 18th century cabinet maker a, a better identity. So thank you all for listening. That, that was terrific, Pat. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to open it to questions while um, those questions are going to be coming in through the chat screen. Please remember to ask questions on chat. I, I have several that come to mind. Um, I've shared with you before, this is, I, I've, I've come to furniture um, quite recently, having been at a Western History Museum for two decades. Uh, we certainly had furniture, but it was sort of a different um, a different style and um, and we thought about it in different ways too. Um, th there are two questions that sort of I, 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 I'm thinking about um, and both of them have to do with mobility and communication. Um, 
And you know, you've, you point to this really sort of interesting thing, right? That um, in these export pieces, they're literally putting advertisements uh, into their labels, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my, my, my question is to sort of think about, uh, in some sense, you've talked about how distribution worked, but one, um, how, did, how did that consumer network come to be and how did the distribution network come to be what what is what is that mobility like or is it very easy to get furniture to north carolina or elsewhere is it um are furniture makers really able to talk to each other so much that they're or, or see other people's furniture that they're um, as you've pointed out that someone like daniel spencer is integrating this into his work um if there's any way you can sort of talk about the mobility and the communication between other furniture makers and between consumers and producers. Um, I'd really like to learn more about that. Well, um, how, I suppose that um, I think uh, economically um, uh, for these furniture makers in Rhode Island, um, the local market had to was small and it probably was very difficult to um really make a living just serving the local market and so i think um somehow um they uh, realized that among the products that are getting shipped down the coast um, and one thing I forgot to do today was to, uh, to read uh, what was said about um, uh, the makers um, in an article um, that was published in uh, the Newport paper in 1849 um, that is talking about the history. Can you imagine 1849, they're recording the history of 18th century Newport cabinet makers. Right. right. And um, the article says that all the cabinet makers on Bridge and Washington streets employed a large number of hands manufacturing furniture for which a ready market was found in New York and the West Indies. Hmm. The stores of David Huntington and Benjamin Baker were also on the point, that is that little bit of land out there. Both these men were extensively engaged in manufacturing furniture which they shipped to New York and the West Indies. Benjamin Peabody, who carried on a large trade with Suriname, and we saw tonight the painting of the sea captain's carousing in Suriname. So he is sending furniture down to Suriname, and uh, the article describes him as an ingenious man. Um, so um, I do believe that, um, um, there were there is documentation for instance that um abraham redwood um had a friend in antigua who wanted a desk and uh, he puts him in touch with christopher townsend so i um you know those plantation economies were really all about growing and producing sugar and other produce um cotton to a certain extent and they weren't making things like furniture and riding chairs. Um, and so it must have begun slowly, but you know, they realized that um, their bread and butter probably was really, uh, to judge by John Cajon, 34% of his business is for export and only 20% right. locally, that if they want to make um, uh, make out economically. They need to to serve this export market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have, you know, little twenty year old Eunice Rhodes coming from Providence to shop right. in Newport, right. and yeah. she obviously knows what John Goddard makes. And you know, she, her family could have known Jabez Baldwin or uh, Bowen or uh, Moses Brown, who bought furniture from John Goddard, and right. so. If you're fashionable in Providence in the 1760s, um, you know you know that the most 
beautiful stuff is being made in Newport, I mm -hmm. do believe. Um, uh, you know, the Providence, the what I call the indigenous Providence tradition, you know, it's, it's wonderful furniture, no doubt about it. Do I think it's as accomplished as the Newport furniture? I don't really. It always it's a little has aspects that are slightly quirky. Mm. So I think, and Mary Arnold, who owned the um, the John Townsend High Trust, um, you know, she lived in uh, East Greenwich. So mm. she, somehow she, her family, whoever, know to go to pro to Newport to, um, um, you know get these beautifully fabricated objects. Right. I wonder if it's, I mean, to some extent you're talking about a network, sort of word of mouth, but I also know from sort of other 18th century consumer histories that some of this was in newspapers too. As, as I think you showed us, um, you know, circulars and newspapers and broadsides and things like that, right? Yeah, but, uh, you know, the furniture makers don't tend to begin to advertise um, uh, much before the late colonial period. Um, uh, you know, when Daniel Spencer moves to um, Providence, he puts an ad in the newspaper. That's one of the ways we know he was there. In fact, that's um, that documentation puts him there earlier than I had from other sources, um, and that was a 1772 ad. Um, and um, but I'd have to look. I'm, um, but I don't think you really get them advertising in newspapers much before that. Mm -hmm. Interesting, Caitlin. Do we have any questions? We do, we do. Um, so the, fir the first question um, that I'll pose to you, Pat, is actually just a very quick um, clarifying question. Mm -hmm. um, someone has asked um, if the furniture exhibit is open at Yale, and I think they're referring to the furniture archive that you mentioned um, with the website. So is that just a website or is there, there, is there an actual exhibit that people would go to? Uh, the archive is an online uh, right. resource. Um, the what they may be referring to is the furniture study. Uh, we have a new furniture study at Yale, which opened in the fall of 2019. Uh, it is a 17,000 square foot facility. It's got more than 1,300 pieces of furniture in it, and lots of cabinet making tools and models of cabinet making joints and upholstery techniques and the like. I mean, it is really a remarkable new facility. Unfortunately, it is closed uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, we were having very popular weekly tours there before we had to shut down in March. Um, every Friday, we offered a public tour. Some were specialized talks. Others were just looking at the whole place. Um, and uh, at this point in time, I think museums are saying, we don't know when we can bring together a group of people um, for a tour. When is that going to be safe? Right, we've in fact, I mean, so, so we are open, but we have, we're not touring right now. But Pat, I wonder also if this wasn't a question about the furniture at the Yale Art Galleries, right? So how are, is, are the Yale Art Galleries open to the public right now? The Yale Art Galleries are not open to the public right now. Um, and uh, our administration has asked that um, the special exhibitions, which had to close down, be available in the fall semester. Only the special exhibitions, which does not include the furniture mm. display or any of the other permanent galleries. Uh, and we have yet to hear from the administration of the university as to whether they'll allow that. They're being very, very cautious about having visitors come to campus. I mean, yeah. they very concerned about keeping the student body uh, safe. The students sure. will probably have access um, um, uh, when they do come back in the fall, but it will not, in all likelihood, it will, if, it's, if it is open to the public, it'll be ticketed and it will only be open for the special exhibitions. Um, right. We're hoping right. that this pandemic, you know, gets, resolved um, with um, 
you know, a vaccine or something so that we can, you know, open up these fantastic resources um, yeah. to everyone. We're all, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a huge challenge in the museum world. And we've been fortunate um, in Newport to be able to open our spaces. But even we are being incredibly careful and all entries contactless. You have to buy your tickets online. You have to schedule a time. Um, a place like Whitehorn, uh, we can't have more than 12 people in any given moment. Uh, at rough points, we can't have more than 40. Um, so it's going to be a tremendous challenge uh, for all of us who work in the museum field. I have some colleagues on the line tonight from Los Angeles, and I was just talking to a few of them, and I know that they were getting very excited about opening, and now that may be, you know, that's now in question. So, Caitlin, other questions? Yes. Um, so another question, um, this one, so, um, so Becca uh, from Newport Film is um, very interested in hearing more about um, the collectors of the furniture. So um, she's asking if, in the process of completing the furniture archive, if you um, have broken any hearts as you've been able to attribute more pieces <laughs> to a journeyman instead of like a big name like Townsend or Goddard, um, for example. I don't think so. I think I've probably made more people happy by discovering uh, signatures in their objects than um, than uh, and some you know nice signatures um, like uh, James Goddard, uh, Joe Townsend uh, that they had no idea were there, um, and or the little squiggly loopy things that um, Daniel Spencer used. There's only one signed Daniel Spencer piece. It's a simpler desk and bookcase. Um, and that's how we know we can associate those squiggles with him, um, or the person ones. Um, well, you certainly made us happy. You came to Whitehorn and said, this is you know, assuredly Daniel Spencer. That, that was not that long ago, actually. Right. Feels like forever at this point, but it was not, it really wasn't that long yeah. ago. I think when I was studying your furniture in depth, I believe the, the chest on chest was off for restoration. And so in the two sweeps I made at, or three or four with Jennifer Johnson, um, we didn't actually get to see it. And mm. unfortunately it took me quite a while to get, to come back and right. take a look, which I'm, I'm very grateful to all the access that, um, the Newport Restoration Foundation has provided because, um, you know, when you come and tear things apart, and it's very time consuming to babysit that kind of intensity. <laughs> it was worth I'm it. I'm grateful to many, many institutions and right. many, many collectors who've given me the privilege of studying their furniture in depth. Yeah. I see this question, Caitlin, I'll go ahead and answer it. Joan asks, will this lecture be available after online anywhere? Um, yes, eventually all of these sessions, um, and I encourage you to, to come to the live sessions so that you can ask questions, that you can be part of this special event. Um, but yes, eventually we will edit these pieces and make them available on YouTube. And I think they'll be um, a, a nice learning tool for many people. Um, Caitlin, did you see any other questions? Um, so, so another question um, that we had also from Joan <laughs> um, is she's asking, uh, how do we protect this furniture and history in a world turning to minimalism? I, I'm going to jump in if you don't mind, Pat, and give you time to think about this. Uh, this program actually emerged precisely from that question, Joan. So I became the director of museums here about 18 months ago and um, was in, you know, duly impressed with the collection and the history of Newport furniture, only to find out that these works are increasingly being dismissed as brown furniture, um, which struck me as, as odd and, and curious. Um, these pieces are beautiful. They possess tremendous history. They tell stories that Pat has told you today and many, many more. Um, so how do you, how do we protect them? We 
I think you support institutions like ours and, and our colleagues at RISD and our colleagues at the Boston MFP and um, the National Gallery has an exceptional collection um, because we are doing that work and making the case furniture every day. Um, also, of course, the Yale Art Gallery where, uh, where Pat has been working for years. Um, any other thoughts on that, Pat? Well, I mean, I think compared to um, lots of furniture, um, uh, let's say 18th century furniture, um, the furniture made in um, France, furniture made in England. Um, uh, American furniture, I think, tends to be um, much more um, sort of accessible, if you will. And um, while it certainly is not minimalist, um, uh, there are s some pieces of early American furniture. Um, they may not be the six shell uh, desk and bookcases, but uh, the Windsor chair that was shown earlier, um, a simple tea table. Uh, if, if you, the classic Rhode Island tea table, uh, the slipper foot rectangular tea table, um, uh, I am sure could sit in a minimalist interior and feel perfectly at home. <laughs> yes, sure. Um, Caitlin, other questions? Yes, yeah, so Tom uh, is asking if there's a database of Newport furniture um, and sort of a follow up to that one, um, is anyone documenting pieces in private collections and things like that for future study? Well, that's what the Rhode Island Furniture Archive does. It is underlying this, uh, this is a website, but underlying the, um, the website is a database that has um, uh, about uh, 6,700 records of um, uh, pieces of furniture that either are uh, probably made in Rhode Island um, were once said to be made in Rhode Island, um, but are not. Um, and, um, and with some very simple, let's say tavern tables, it's very hard to know if they're made in Rhode Island or they made in Eastern Connecticut or they make in Southeastern Massachusetts. Um, so, but what we've attempted to do is record the history of these pieces. Uh, right now online, you only get one image of each record. Many of these things we have spent years uh, going to auction previews, the institutions and collections I've discussed, uh, taking detail um, photographs of the decorative elements of the construction. And I'm working on migrating this database from a server at the Yale Art Gallery to uh, the University Library to their cross-collection discovery platform. And once we do that, uh, we'll be able to show multiple images. And I think uh, it will be an even greater uh, research if, resource. If you can look at the dovetails, you can look how the feet are put together. If you can get a real close up of the shell, which um, in its current iteration, you just really get an overall view. So please visit the website. That is um, where it is. Yeah, that's, um, I, it's, it's a phenomenal resource. I encourage everyone to take a look at it. Um, other questions, Caitlin? Um, yeah, so we also have um, a question about um, like the, the craftsmen who are making the furniture. If, if we know how much we know about them were, any of them, hold on one second, sorry, I'm rereading the question. Um, yeah, so if, the, if any of the journeymen were African-American, how much we know about that? Um, and then if you have any books that you might recommend. Unfortunately, um, I have not turned up any evidence of African-Americans actually um, uh, either freed African-Americans or enslaved African-Americans. We know there were many slaves owned in Rhode Island um, making furniture. I'm sure they probably were, 
um, I just have never been able to find the evidence. And I have been in the process of creating this database. Um, I have read through all the court records that survive. You saw a lot of evidence tonight from uh, the court records, the Rhode Island court records from all the counties are amazing in that not only the record books, but the file papers, many of the file papers survive. And, um, and uh, it was a very litigious age in the mid 18th mm. century. And so there's lots and lots of suing, usually over debt, but sometimes over other things. Uh, I've read all the town records in Rhode Island, the land records, the um, uh, probate records, the um, town council records, um, where you might, in the probate, you might pick up, you know, the fact that somebody owns a, a slave who's a furniture maker. You know, it could be a house slave, I mean, um, a house servant, um, but I honestly, I can't even remember an example of someone slave. I, I would add um, so that, that I see that question and it refers to um, a pop-up exhibit we did last year with the 1696 Heritage Foundation, highlighting the role of um, people of African heritage in in Newport, in the trades in Newport, in, in a range of things in Newport. Um, and we are, uh, we at NRF and my colleagues at Newport Historical Society, um, and I'm hoping a few other organizations in the near future, we are interested in looking into this a little bit more. I, I think Pat points to the positive material and, and, I, and of course, um, having spent career in this work, she would know where the bodies are buried better than I would. But um, we think we're going to try and take a look, um, possibly through a multicultural internship, and seeing if we can tell, um, if not stories directly related to furniture, at the very least, um, creating a fuller understanding of just how multicultural a city like, uh, a port city like Newport would have been in the 18th century and building on that. And I think very often in the history of marginalized people, um, sometimes the best you're going to be able to do is to spotlight their existence and their participation in the economy uh, rather than getting at uh, very, very specific kinds of work. If we find it, nobody's going to hide it. But we are, you know, I think we're, we're, we're interested in learning more about it and as we learn more, and as I'm sure as Pat learns more, as anybody learns more, mm -hmm. you'll learn more. And in terms of any books you can recommend, uh, we might be able to recommend um, in that field, um, go ahead and write to me, Joan. I can uh, talk to you a little bit more specifically about um, works about um, African heritage people in colonial New England. So please be in touch. There definitely is evidence in um, documents like uh, Aaron Lopez's account of uh, African Americans being involved in things like shipbuilding, um, right. trades that really needed, um, you know, a lot of manpower. Um, but so far, I have not. Uh, I'm sure it's there. It, I'm sure they were involved, um, but I just haven't stumbled on the evidence. Right. Right. Right, we're able to surmise certain things, but what we're not able to do is say, see that desk over there? We know that John Townsend's, you know, John Townsend had a, a, a enslaved person or uh, somebody who had been freed who worked on that. That that seems to escape us right now, but, uh, but people are really interested in looking at it. And please be in touch, Joan. Um, other questions? Um, yeah, so, so Alan, um is interested in the Newport small desk um, that was, hold on, that was shipped to Nova Scotia um, and, or found in Nova Scotia. So um, he's asking if, there, if you have any idea if it was shipped directly to Nova Scotia or taken by, um, you know, someone leaving the United States and moving there. Um, I have said, and I believe um, that in the in the Rhode Island furniture book, um, that it probably was shipped there in the 18th century. 
um, the fact that, I think the fact that the label says made by John Goddard uh, in Newport, on Rhode Island, in New England, um, means he knew he was sending it uh, far away from, um, from New England even, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, Nova Scotia was not New England. Um, so he, um, that's what makes me feel we can um, uh, come to the conclusion that it probably was shipped out of the, out of New England mm -hmm. in the 18th century, in 1745. Um, right. It could be wrong, but um, the paper evidence of the label would suggest otherwise. Terrific. I think we're going to call it a night. Um, it's been a long day for many of us. Um, this was delightful. Thank you so much, Pat, Thank for you joining for us. Me. Oh, it's, it's what a pleasure. Um, we will be uh, hosting a conversation tomorrow with Brock Job from Winterthur and Stephen Brown from the North Bennett Street School. And we'll be talking more about um, the history of makers, about people making furniture in the past, trying to understand um, some of that. Uh, many of the theme, Pat, Pat gave us a wonderful primer to continue to discuss over the next few days. In fact, the following day is two distinct makers of furniture, Jeffrey Green, who does work in the style of Townsend and Goddard, and then Jonathan Bratt, who is a, a more modern maker, but lives on Aquidneck Island and understands that legacy. And then in the last day, we'll, we'll be joined by NRF staff and uh, staff from the uh, Newport Historical Society to discuss the role of museums in all of this. I hope you'll continue to join us. Um, I hope you're enjoying this program. Uh, we will be making this available on YouTube in the future, but I, I can't predict exactly when that will be. Um, for now, let me just say on behalf of the Newport Restoration Foundation and my colleagues here on screen, um, Thank you very much for attending, and I hope everyone stays well and safe. Good night.